My name is Andrew Taylor, Group Planning Director for Countryside Properties. Thank you all very much for coming um, to this uh, workshop. Um, I'll introduce people in a moment and I'll, I'll just talk through the purpose of the website. But just to start with, and just to remind people to hopefully stay on, on mute. I, I, I now have the power to mute people because we had some people talking off screen in the, in the, last, in the last session. But uh, oh no, I see uh, Justin Griggs. So I might definitely have to mute Justin if he starts chatting away, um, as just popped up. So um, uh, thank you very much for, for joining us. Um, this session is, is looking at building communities. So the relationship and the engagement between um, developers, local government, parish town councils, um, and, and the thought process that, that goes, and sorry, and civic societies, and, and the thought process, process that goes through that. And the important thing that I think we're going to try and unpick is thinking about the engagement, the partnership, and the empowerment of people, and thinking about the longer term stewardship at all sorts of different scales. Um, and that's the benefit that we're try hopefully going to try and bring with the wonderful panel that we've got. Um, so I'm going to very briefly introduce people and then as they, they speak, perhaps they'll give a, a little bit more of a flavour um, of, of where, who they're representing and, and, the, and the perspective they're talking about. We've got uh, Jonathan Warren, who will start off in a moment. He's Chief Executive of Ocalis, followed then by Martin Hamilton, who is Director of Leeds Civic Trust, but he's also a trustee of the of Civic Voice and, and speaking on their behalf as well. Councillor Andrew Irwin, who's Chair of Tangmere Parish Council in, in Chichester. Uh, one of my colleagues, Em Timmins, who is Associate Director in our planning team. And then I will say a few words at the end. And then at the end, we'll have hopefully a few minutes for any questions um, from people joining. Otherwise, I will, I will think up some um, difficult questions to chuck at our, uh, our panel. Um, so I'm going to, uh, people, some people got slides, so they'll be sharing their screen as, as we go through. So I'm going to ask Jonathan, Jonathan Warren to kick off to start with um, and say a few words from his perspective. Jonathan, over to you. Good afternoon, Andrew. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jonathan Warren, Chief Executive of Lacalis, an independent place-focused think tank. Um, we exist to serve the forces of localism to put place community and identity at the heart of national policy making. Um, so th thanks for the opportunities to speak today about our report, Building Communities, and how this fits in. Um, the context is that there's no greater issue driving division in domestic politics than the serious gap between aspirations for home ownership and you know, the effects of constrained supply. So figures out today showing that since the pandemic, um, the, the greatest economic collapse in 300 years of recorded economic history. Prices have gone through um, the route 15 percent. And when we have a situation in which um, if we don't build or supply enough affordable homes where people not only just wish but need to live, um, we're creating an unhappy reality for a younger generation that is seemingly priced out of the housing market. So. If we're to turn the tide of the times and to render a more rational housing market, one broadened with a wider mix of property types and tenures, we're going to have to face down and overcome with a sense of creativity and optimism what makes the current system broken. And with this in mind, through dialogue with Andrew after, on the back of a webinar we did in October 2020, in which we looked at the, the white paper planning for the future, and try to discern uh, what's the role for the community in here. We, we started our work building communities and let's um, start sharing the screen. So building communities, planning for a um, clean and good growth future was um, the name of our report. Um, what we try to do here, essentially we're trying to answer some research questions with Countryside on the role of developers in boosting local productivity and well-being, looking at the role of new development in pushing environmental goals and desires, looking at the role of local government in all its forms as a partner in the above, and from the top down, looking at the role of central government in setting a facilitatory planning policy. And the idea was to come up with a policy report with recommendations across all these levels. Very much building communities, as the title would suggest, was a focus on community. 
and especially around the, the planning process as it's developing um, engagement and collaboration for central government policy, local government developers, and our community groups. We were focusing on some of the more popular visible aspects of the planning bill around cutting bureaucracy and raising accessibility and visibility of the planning process. And what we're really quite delighted to do in this is to use successful examples of community collaboration in getting new homes built, particularly via neighbourhood plans, to really stress the value of honest engagement between authorities, developers and communities in the context of national housing targets. And we'll hear more from Tangmere later, but that was one of our poster boys for um, doing good in this context. So really what we're trying to do here was look at the role of community in planning at different scales, national, strategic, local, but most importantly, neighborhood level. Um, so it's really two, two angles to what good and clean growth is. Um, on one side, look at the report, we're looking at placemaking and community, participation, public health, environment, cultural investment and social infrastructure. Um, in terms of economic growth, the role of economic anchors, major employers, about improving skills, uh, intelligent procurement strategies, using social value to give communities what they really want from the provision of local infrastructure and services. Um, corollary of skills, better jobs, employment quality, and driving the sort of inward investment that will boost place prosperity and make sure places have a purpose. Um, slides here um, from the, the BBC adaptation of Douglas Adams's sci-fi comic masterpiece, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, Beware of the Leopard. Well, um, the, the, the context here is um, we force our researchers to look through all local authority websites to do some original data research. And um, pretty much that it's, in terms of visibility of what people can see um, um, available from their, their local council's websites, more than 92, I think it's higher than that, don't have um, did online access to planning notices or decisions. Um, there's no easy portal. What you get is a list of PDFs you've got to repeatedly search for. And these are of individual... Jonathan, so, Jonathan, sorry, just can I check? Someone said the slides aren't showing. Can you... Um... There's other people. Have anyone else got a problem with the slides? I don't know where you're. Just check. There, I can't see them. I can just see the first one, if that helps. Ah, thank you. Can anyone else see these slides? You might need to try and reshare or something. No, I think everyone's seeing this title shide. <laughs> yeah, you haven't started the slideshow. Thanks. What you're seeing now, folks. Perfect. Beware of the leopard. Off you go. Okay, so let's go take it back one. So yeah, Hitchhiker's Guide. Thing. So essentially, look, um, a lot of this is hiding in, in, in plain sight. It brings back to poor old, um, when he was the, the fat man in the hurry as local government secretary, Eric Pickles, who lamented at the 2014 local government association conference that um, uh, he, he, he made the connection. He said, look, um, as Arthur Dent's house is being demolished by the council, he's told by planning officers that the notice has been in his council's display department for the last nine months. A department located in the basement, in a disused lavatory, without a light or stairs, in the bottom of a locked filing cabinet, with a sign on the door saying, beware of the leopard. So it's essentially getting quite through the 21st century now. Um, we're still living under the shadow of the leopard. Um, and the, the, the same also applies. We, we did a similar deep dive into principal council authorities, um, strategies around community hubs and spaces. And it's still more than two in five don't seem to have a strategy um, for this. So um, what we really wanted to get to is kind of what, 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 are, the, what, what, are, the, what are the answers here? Um, um, how do we build reform in, in a way that manages everyone's interests coming towards this kind of stewardship model, which you see well what you can do when you've got control of the situation. 
I think a great obvious example is around King's Cross Station. I sort of first came to work and study around London in the early 90s. It's a complete contrast to what it is now. You know, stewardship models where you have control, you can do things differently. Um, so what this really involves is greater rights and increased responsibilities placed on council, councils, developers, and communities. Um, for central government, I think for our mind, it's getting to understand the sheer necessity of community involvement. If um, Michael Gove um, is you know, in his, you know, his rebranded department, is going to get um, get the, the, the planning reforms to work. Um, and it's, I think it's quite useful, Andrew. We've got sort of Danny Kruger, who represents the communitarian wing of of of, of conservative thought on board. So you've got things like you know, hands up st street votes and all the rest of it. Um, I, th I think that's pretty much on side then. So we launched our report, Building Communities in time for the party conference season at the end of September, start of October. And our premise is that when we're talking about new housing, in effect, we're talking about the creation of new communities, um, communities which will need to sit comfortably and happily within the social setting and local economy of where they're cited. So uh, try not to repeat mistakes of the past. The policy challenge isn't to manufacture consent in that awful phrase, but to genuinely engender popular approval for new homes where they're most needed within existing communities. And if you know, post COP26 and all that, our aim of is true sustainability in the terms of creating for the long term um, and the flourishing of both people and places. Um, every actor in this housing dance from central government and its agencies, principally Homes England who are advocates of the stewardship model, local authorities, developers and communities like each have got their unique role to play in this planning dance to realising a clean and good growth future. Planning has a role. I think we answered that question we posed last October. The October before last, Andrew, it's um, well resourced and astutely directed. Planning can underscore the housing and government levelling up ambition. But for it to happen, there's going to have to be, um, even post spending review, um, effort from central government to carry the fair share of the burden towards affordable mixed tenure and sustainable housing, especially given all the extra costs arising from net zero, um, um, in terms of carbon offsetting, energy, and all the rest of it. Um, and on the other side, the community side, um, in addressing the challenge of truly local consent for new housing, um, look, we've got some good things. The, the, no, the, the new models of design codes, um, which were published as locally approved and commonly agreed styles for local homes, in our view, a good thing. The office for place now, can be a champion of community consent, which kind of leads us towards but what, what this report's finally advocating, that kind of stewardship model. Um, so I'm gonna get back to presentation here. Um, so um, in terms of what, what's kind of needed here, can everyone see slides, okay? Yes, yep. Lovely. So in terms of like, what's the ask of central government? Um, look. We need to, if neighborhood plans can work. Now we've got the evidence. Um, Tangmi is, is the actual proof. Provide a capacity fund for more neighborhood planning, make it better. And for, de for development, a better carbon offsetting fund. Obviously new things going around S106, SIL, amend the infrastructure level levy. So it's paid at the point of commencement on site and includes ring fence share, affordable housing provision. Now, if people want the infrastructure, it's got to be there at the point of commencement, not afterwards. Health and well-being is important. Let's get health impact assessments as a requirement in the national planning policy framework. Also in the MPPF, let's define and protect social infrastructure um, through, um, through this. And uh, in terms of visibility, let's have a central portal where residents can see development plans and decisions for their area in their entirety and in one place. And uh, one size doesn't fit all. Acknowledge a need for a regional, a varied approach for new building. The challenges of garden cities in the southeast are different to brownfield in the, in the West Midlands and the north. 
Um, and no, let's have kind of boards for regional spatial planning. And uh, we were on a call last yesterday with um, Richard Blythe and friends from the Royal Tanning, Town Planning Institute. That would work for green boards too. So essentially what this takes us to um, is finally um, a strategic framework for stewardship, a stewardship model. Um, essentially local stakeholders, councils, developers, communities need to be working together, pure and simple, no ifs, no buts. They need to be working towards a shared vision of place, knowing each other's needs and priorities and working harmoniously to deliver what's needed. Um, this would entail land being built out in a sustainable manner over a set period of years, but with a proper focus on placemaking. And it will only truly work as a vision if the community share in and understand the context for, for local growth. As with all local and hyper-local matters, trust, building it, maintaining it's key. Um, so, so in terms of roles, responsibilities, you know, councils should you know, use some um, social value to give communities the benefits they want from development. Um, they should work with communities using the local design codes um, to embed neighborhood plans. Um, they should produce cultural statements, especially in the context of high street and town center, regeneration, repurposing, um, containing the provision and the protection of cultural <laughs> assets. Um, in terms of community engagement, they no, commit to a hybrid model, better digital, better um, in-person outreach through more extensive physical events and use their convening power to act as bridges between developers and communities. Um, I ask of communities that produce neighborhood plans um, you, through your parishes in line with government targets and on the developer side, um, amend and um, work with the developers forums, support strong collective place leadership and strategic planning. Um, no strike deals with, with, with your councils, productivity deals for local labor markets, skills, better employment and wages, and where you've got something over a, a larger scale, run a local growth board to oversee the productivity side of that deal. So um, that's pretty much um, our sort of building communities report. Um, put it through the, the chat box for anyone who wants to find and that link to the report. Happy to field questions afterwards, Andrew. Jonathan, thanks very much. Um, and I think what we'll also try and do perhaps is uh, uh, via, via now we'll try and get the all the presentations um, circulated as well. Perfect time for my phone to ring. Um, uh, Ma Martin, I'm going to pass straight over to you for you to do yours. Thanks very much. Uh, yeah, Martin Hamilton, Director of Leeds Civic Trust and also a, um, a Civic Voice Trustee. Um, in a previous uh, life, I was a local, a local councillor in Leeds. Um, I uh, chaired uh, one of the plans panels, was on, involved in planning for most of that time. Uh, so um, I've always had an interest in planning and, and community involvement. So this talk is really just a little bit about Civic Voice, about some of the, the, the priorities of Civic Voice, and then I'm gonna just talk about a specific example uh, of a project that we've been engaged in um, here in Leeds. Um, oops, so um, just to say, um, these are our mission, this is our mission statements as an organization, Civic Voice. So clearly uh, a big uh, part of uh, our um, interest is in places and placemaking. Um, we're interested in how uh, our members can get more involved um, in, in uh, creating a vision and implementing a vision for their local areas. Um, I think inevitably civic societies and, um, and, and trusts tend to be more engaged already. The fact that they've decided to join an organisation such as that tends to mean that they're more engaged. Um, and clearly civic pride is a big is also a big part of um, what Civic Voice uh, stands for. Um, and, and clearly we believe in a planning system with um, greater community participation than the one that we have at the moment. Um, just a couple of stats to, to sort of present really. And um, I think there is a sense in which uh, trust in, in developers, trust in local authorities is pretty low. This was some research that Grosvenor did uh, quite recently. 
and then asking our our members uh, about their experiences um, most feel that it's difficult uh, for uh, residents community groups to influence uh, the planning system um, and and indeed um, sorry I'm just moving my slides to a place so I can see the final sentence there and also getting involved at an early stage something that we're always very keen to do we don't want to be involved when it's a done deal we want to to try and shape development and um, I think uh, many um, of our members feel that that's something that they don't get the opportunity to do. Um, so I guess you know for, 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 for us the question is how can communities play an active and a more active role in the planning process and I wanted to talk very briefly about a project that we've had in Leeds which took a particular approach to this issue around uh, community involvement. Um, so I'm going to talk about a project called the East Side um, Leeds East Side, for those of you that know Leeds, um, this is the area that I'm talking about. So um, this is um, the area that includes the Leeds Playhouse, it includes the bus station, it includes the bottom end of the Leeds, the Leeds Kergate Market, the Minster, um, it, the, the Royal Armour is on the, uh, on the bottom end of it. Um, a lot of our cultural institutions, quite a lot of our uh, further education institutions fall within this area. Um, it's the area that people may be familiar with where Quar the Quarry Hill flats used to be, the 1930s uh, uh, very large complex of flats that were demolished in the late 70s. Um, and what you have is an area with um, uh, a significant amount of um, toing and froing, so people, people passing through the area to use the cultural facilities, to use the colleges, to work. Um, people who um, maybe uh, work in the area. Uh, but a relatively small number of people who actually live in the area. This is an area with a lot of brown field sites, um, an area that is that is very much in development, but where approvals exist for something like 4,000, 4, 5,000 5, apartments. So we're expecting over the next few years for this area to be transformed from an area that is primarily, primarily an area to, to work in or to visit to one that actually has um, a settled community. The question is, how do we make and create an area that is livable. How do we create an area? And you can see from that map on the right hand side that, that there's a real spaghetti of roads. Um, it's actually quite inhospitable. It's, it's in, fact, in effect a series, series of islands. So when it becomes uh, developed and the, the blue blocks there are the um, infill sites that have got approval um, and the dark blue is, is one that is under construction. So lots of lots are in the pipeline. How do we make this, make this a better area and how can people influence that process? So what we decided to do was to launch a competition. Um, so um, this flowed from um, a transport vision that we produced um, a couple of years ago. Um, but it's really about uh, looking at placemaking, looking at how transport and planning join, join together, um, particularly in an area such as this. So we took as our starting point, let's have a competition, let's get some ideas how, about how we make this a, a, better, a better area for people to live in. A good example of why that, that is needed is, is this map here, which shows that um, uh, a walk of about seven or eight minutes from a pub uh, from, from Saxton Lane, uh, some, uh, some council, uh, council flats to the Palace pub, which is next to the Minster, um, should take about seven minutes, but it involves crossing 19 lanes of traffic. Um, you know, it's absolutely crazy and, and clearly an area like that isn't, isn't people friendly at all. Um, so we started off with a workshop, we brought people together, we brought local residents, uh, we brought, brought, brought some of the people that have uh, uh, places of work uh, within this area, but also people from outside of the area, architects, transport planners, surveyors, uh, and people who just have an interest in, in placemaking. So a mixture of people. We had a lot of uh, students involved in this session as well. We got some maps out. We got some Sharpie pens out. We got some post-it notes out. We started to look at what the key, what the, what the main issues were in the area and how they might be resolved. So that was to sort of set the scene for the competition and to, to set the parameters of the competition, uh, which we ran, um, which, which we ran um, just as COVID hit. So we were hoping to have lots of physical workshops. That wasn't possible, but we did have um, a large number of entries. Um, the winning entrant on the left-hand side was from someone called Hannah Beard. We also had a, a, a very young entrant, a guy called Finn Cawley, nine-year-old, who had some particular, uh, particularly interesting ideas around um, uh, how to uh, make the area easier to walk through. So very professionally presented ideas with lots of information, 
Some of the ideas were simply one side of A4 with some writing on or some drawn sketches. We wanted, we didn't want the competition to have put up any barriers. We were welcoming ideas from absolutely anyone. And there was some prize money attached to this, I should say. Um, so what we then did was uh, taking the various ideas, ideas that came in, um, we then uh, pulled those together into a, a document. So uh, about 10 key ideas that, that we felt could be taken forward to improve this area. Um, so, so they were consolidated in this document and they drew on all the competition entries in some shape or form. Um, we also um, held some walks. This was a sound walk that the winning um, entry um, uh, uh, put, uh, uh, held. And that was uh, the idea of that was to, to, to navigate the area with earphones on, listening to the experiences of the people that actually lived there or people that work there, or people that pass through the area, to, to, to get their aspirations as you're walking through the area um, as to how it could be improved. And the, and the walk finished at this billboard, um, which was a collage of some of the ideas that came forward through the competition. Um, so that was, that, was the, um, th that was sort of, if you like, drawing people in to think about some of these new ideas. And then the, the stage we're at now is actually producing something more formal for consultation. So we have an interactive map, which identifies a handful of key uh, interventions that we feel could be made uh, to make the area better. And we're calling it a supplementary planning document. Um, we, we, we're, now, we're now consulting on that. We're holding meetings with different interest groups uh, to refine the document. And the reason that we're doing this is because um, it became clear from fairly early on that whilst the City Council was supportive of, of this initiative, they didn't feel they had the resources to actively get involved. So it was a case of, well, we will actually take the lead. We will produce something that ultimately will become a, a settled planning document and which will hopefully shape the way that this area develops into the future. So I think for, for, for me, there are sort of three or four things that come out of this. Um, you know, should community, how, how should community groups um, get involved in uh, shaping their areas? And should they actually be able to take the lead, take the slack, take up some of the slack local, where local authorities maybe don't have the resources to do these things themselves? And then how do we give the work that they do credibility? Um, you know, what, what standing does it actually have? Um, is it the quality of the outputs? Is it how many members of the community are involved? In this particular instance, there isn't a huge community because it, it is by its very nature, a community that is being created in, in the future. Um, and where does the local authority role start and how can we actually manage the stakeholder expectations? So this is just one example of something we've, we've done uh, at Leeds Civic Trust, but hopefully uh, an interesting one. Thank you. Martin, thank you very much for that. Um, and, and just for everyone else, just to note, I have been putting some links in the chat, uh, both to um, Localis earlier on, and then Lead Civic Trust, Civic Voice, and then a specific link to the East Side project as well that Martin's just been talking about. So do 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 uh, click on those, but uh, obviously as soon as you leave this session, they will disappear. So if you want them, click on them before you leave. Um, so uh, passing over now to, to Councillor Andrew Irwin. Uh, as I said earlier, Andrew is Chair of Tangmere Parish Council and going to take us through his experience or their experience of um, uh, local plans, neighbour plans, etc. So Andrew, over to you. Thank you very much, David, Andrew. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Tangmere is a small village sitting on the south coast of, of England, three miles east of Chichester and six miles north of Bognor on the floodplain overlooking the South Downs National Park. There have been a series of local consultations and village questionnaires over the last 20 years aimed at <clears throat> identifying the aspirations of the, of the local residents in relation to the proposed expansion of Tangmere village. The village design statement of 2002 envisaged up to 200 new homes on existing brownfield locations within the village. Tangmere at the crossroads in 2004 developed the issues identified in the 2002 survey and examined the options for up to 500 homes on the airfield site and the potential for up to 600 homes on the greenfield to the west of the community. The Tangmere Action Plan of 2005 identified the Tangmere top 10 aspirations from tactic calming to improve cycle routes connecting the village to its wider community. It also aims to restrict the housing development to, to 300 new homes. This plan was updated in 2008 
and reported on the delivery of many of the desires, but also recognised that parish action plans carried no weight in the planning process. <clears throat> on the 1st of February 2014, a public meeting was held following the designation by Chichester District Council on the 23rd of July 2013 for the whole of Tangmere Parish to, as a neighbourhood area for the purpose of preparing a Tangmere neighbourhood plan. March 2016 saw the publication of the post-examination version of the Tangmere neighbourhood plan, which included the following statement by John Slater, the examiner into the plan. The parish council and the steering group, aided by the task groups, have risen to the challenge when faced with the allocation of a thousand homes and new employment allocation on the edge of their village. They have worked with developers and their consultants collaboratively, and together they have grasped the opportunities that neighbourhood planning offers, and the Tangmere community has set down clear planning, planning principles to guide the house builders and their master planners. This is a good example of positive community planning that recognises that development is coming and clearly states how they expect the new housing areas to be developed. The outcome of the consultation over the years has consistently identified significant issues that are of importance to residents. And it is interesting to note that the same, issue featured, same issues featured in the Tangmin neighbourhood plan as were identified in 2002. Piecemeal development since the RAF left in 1970 has resulted in insufficient investment in infrastructure. So residents sought new community facilities, more cycle routes, equipped play areas near new housing, traffic calming, including safer crossing points, and for the parish council to assess the shortfall in village amenities and open spaces to meet the needs of the existing and the new households who will be moving into the proposed housing. In July 2014, the State of the Parish report, it was noted that Chichester District Council's Policy 18, Tangmere Strategic Development Location, encompassed all the aspirations arising from the consultation exercises conducted by the Parish Council. Specifically, Policy 18's supporting text included an assurance that social and community facilities will be provided, along with residential housing, addressing the local community aspirations, including a high-level strategy for green infrastructure provision at strategic development sites. In August 16, the Parish Council produced a briefing report for the evolving Tangmere Master Plan, which translated the neighbourhood plan and the Policy 18 aspirations into a detailed framework. This report was the result of two workshops held in July 16, which gave further definition to the spatial diagram and supporting policies set out in the neighbourhood plan in order to explore and agree the key principles for a development framework to guide the production of a comprehensive master plan. This briefing report was designed to deliver the one village concept, which is at the heart of the neighbourhood plan, including the clustering of new community facilities, open spaces and amenities around the western edge of the existing community to create a new shared village centre where the old and the new come together. The result of the ongoing conversation with residents over the years was that the reality of the development became accepted and the positives arising from the opportunities for improved infrastructure and facilities became the focus for discussion. So when countryside properties held presentations and public meetings and used a Tangmere neighbourhood plan as the foundation for their presentation, residents were on the same page, making the consultation more rewarding and positive. Residents felt there was a common objective that they were working towards, resulting in a more cooperative and productive discussion. Many developers promote a scheme that does not always sit comfortably with the residents' understandings of the options. So being able to use a neighbourhood plan to drive the master plan was an unusual and helpful tool for these presentations. The outline planning application submitted to Chichester District Council by Countryside Properties endorsed on the 20th of April 2020, was supported by pa Tangmere Parish at the Planning Committee because the application represented a true version of the neighbourhood plan, capturing all the infrastructure and amenity objectives that the parish had been working with the community to deliver. Sitting squarely at the heart of the neighbourhood plan and the master plan briefing report is the concept of one village. 
This is because successive piecemeal developments since the 80s failed to address the needs, nor were able to deliver an identifiable centre to the community. The proposed village main street includes a new two form entry primary school, retail outlets, village square, community facilities, and an open circulation areas, which will create a link between the existing and the new that provides the setting for a shared village centre. This provision is fundamental to the successful integration of the existing village and the new development, and therefore delivery of this community facility is essential for the success of the project. It is therefore of incredible importance that all aspects of the main street are delivered in order to create sufficient footprint to support the various commercial and community enterprises planned for the main street. The largest single challenge which needs to be faced and overcome is any attempt to dilute the provisions of such facilities at the heart of the village, as the area should be adapted to play, community events, and the incidental social interactions that are essential to a healthy community. It needs to provide a place of arrival and activity, a place for meeting and events, a place for playing and staying, and not just a place of passage. I believe with the work that uh, Tangmere Parish Council has done alongside Countryside, will help provide that, that provision. Thank you very much. Andrew, thank you very much for that. Really insightful comment, certainly in relation to the, the benefits of a positive engagement on through the neighbourhood planning and uh, many other types of, uh, sort of parish plans going back uh, over many years. Um, I'm going to pass over to my colleague now, um, Ellen, who's going to uh, talk about the similar or same scheme, um, but from uh, the countryside or, or developer perspective. Ellen, over to you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, hi, everyone. Yep, yeah, I'm an associate planning director in the strategic land team here at Countryside. Um, Countryside develops private and affordable homes uh, through partnerships with landowners, registered providers and local authorities. Uh, and we have a particular focus on urban regeneration schemes, as well as delivering landscape led new communities such as that at Tangmere. Um, so following on from Andrew's presentation, I just wanted to share a bit more with you about our approach to engagement from a developer perspective. Um, but before I kind of delve too much into what we did, I think it's important to step back and consider why we as developers want to engage in the first place. So <clears throat> at Tangmere, we were appointed as the District Council's development partner in 2018. Uh, and that was well after the site had already been allocated in the local plan. So as you've already heard, the site already had a very long history by that point. <clears throat> Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and there'd already been a lot of good work done through the neighbour plan and the master plan briefing report, which we were keen to learn from and build on um, as the scheme developed. So we wanted to be able to bring the community on that journey with us um, as we develop the master planning more detail uh, towards the submission of the outline planning application and to be able to brief people on what we are working on and share as much information as possible, really, to help build that trust uh, that Martin touched on earlier and to encourage people to engage with us in the design process. And also, you know, it helps manage any misinformation that might be out there as well in terms of what scheme may or may not be doing. So in order to deliver the best place possible for Tangmere, we had to understand what the existing community's priorities were for the site uh, and to help inform the design of the scheme as it evolved. And um, the best way to do that ultimately is to sit down and talk to people and building that line of communication and developing those relationships with uh, individuals, with the parish, with the community uh, takes time, but ultimately this is a long-term project and uh, we're probably going to be working alongside each other for the best part of the next 10 years or more um, as this scheme comes forward. So the earlier we can start that conversation, really the better for everyone uh, from our perspective and hopefully the better outcomes we can deliver together as well. So what did we actually do? Well, firstly, we met with community leaders such as Andrew to introduce ourselves uh, and the actual team that was going to be working on the project and to an agree an overall approach to engagement. So what we were going to do, who we were going to speak to and when we were going to do it. And that really helped us to understand their priorities, um, help to establish that working relationship and learn from their local knowledge as well and previous experiences in producing the, the neighbourhood plan particularly to help identify the most successful ways to encourage participation from the community who by this point had already been, heard a lot about the development for a long period of time but up until that point hadn't actually seen anything start to come forward on the ground. 
So to cement this, we kind of produced the programme, uh, which is on your screens now, um, and we shared this with the parish and our consultation website for everybody to see. So effectively setting out the stages of consultation that we were going to do with um, the parish, with the wider community, um, and with the local authority as well, kind of twin tracks alongside the pre app process. So hopefully making it as transparent as possible, um, kind of setting out the firm commitment from us um, and a programme for everyone to follow and for us to be held accountable to as well. And one of the first kind of actions that actually came out of that initial meeting um, was a follow up on site where a group of us walked the site together uh, with members of the parish council, uh, members of our technical design team to help identify key opportunities and constraints on the ground. So for instance, I think it was on that first site visit where somebody pointed out as we were walking around that there was a particular spot where you could get very clear views towards uh, the existing uh, church in Tangmere from one direction, in one direction, uh, Hornicker Windmill to the north in the South Downs, and in the opposite direction, uh, Chichester Cathedral. And we kind of talked about how brilliant it would be if actually we could design the master plan in such a way uh, and shape the open space and the design of kind of green corridors that you could frame and celebrate those views. Um, as part of the development to really help kind of cement it in place and give it more character. And so early on that became a key structuring principle of the master plan kind of building on the, um, the, uh, the briefing report that the parish had already prepared. So we then had a series of initial master plan workshops with the parish council. Um, so at the same time as we were doing our own technical assessments and surveys and getting a better understanding ourselves about things like uh, the amount of land we'd need for attenuation ponds or parts of the site we would need to preserve in situ for archaeology reasons. We were discussing this in real time uh, with the parish so we could all understand the art of the possible on site and to have ultimately better informed debates and discussions about potential design solutions as the master plan evolved. Then when it came to speaking with the wider community, we had a series of in-person events, um, so including some initial informal kind of drop-in sessions, um, followed by a more detailed public exhibition a bit later uh, as the master plan was a bit further progressed. And alongside and in between those events, uh, we tried really hard to keep, uh, to provide regular updates, um, both digitally for our website and for email updates, and also in print through update articles in the local village newsletter, um, which I think is delivered to all homes and businesses in Tangmere um, bi-monthly. Um, and we found that making use of those existing networks and lines of communication is a great way to meet, um, to reach as many people as possible that we might not be able to reach otherwise. Um, so for instance, something we did was uh, have a stall at the village fair, which was held shortly before our public exhibition. And we found that just being there having people available, having uh, you know a few brochures, a few plans out there to talk to people about, uh, and a bowl of sweets, which never hurts. Um, we could reach a much wider audience who might not otherwise be able to come along, or frankly might not be interested in some of the other consultation events that we were we were holding. So I thought I'd finish just with a few photos from some of those events, um, as you'll. Oh skip past them there you go. Um, all pre-COVID as you can tell but hopefully just goes to show how many people you can get engaged in the process um, when you do it in the right way and with the right intentions. Thank you. Thanks very much Ellen and um, so I'm, I'm just going to finish off uh, with a few slides and I think almost taking it right back to where we started um, with Jonathan in terms of uh, building communities and, and, and our approach in terms of uh, how we've taken the work that Localis have, have done um, and thought about it and, and, and you know, thought about how we've already been interacting with communities to then uh, try and integrate it uh, fully across our business. Um, and Ellen's running the slide, so I'm going to say next slide, unfortunately, every so often. So, um, and, and I think this is fundamentally for everybody here, hopefully this is what we're trying to do, not necessarily the picture on the right, um, that's not necessarily relevant to you, but the bit on the left, you know, we are all here to create, you know, when we're talking about new development or even existing places, we are here to create places that people love to live in, and that's got to be the, 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 the grounding principle. And I think that just means thinking beyond just houses, thinking about the social digital infrastructure. Um, we've talked about that a bit already, thinking about the transport and the green spaces um, and how those will meet the local needs um, and engaging those communities and empowering those communities. And, and Andrew spoke about, you know, that the various different lists that the 10 kiosks or whatever, they, and, and, and how 
the communities can identify those things and then from the developer's perspective it's trying to pick up on those and take those forward and use those as a way of helping the new development to integrate help to pick up on some of those asks and obviously try and respond to those and, and deliver and um, so from our perspective it, it it's not just about creating those homes, trying to create that quality and sustainable building, but it's about then supporting and engaging communities at each stage. Um, so next, please. And I think that's really important. Ellen mentioned um, a lot of this uh, urban regeneration that we do as, as well. And actually in, in those, it, it can be as equally difficult as, as new development um, on, on green spaces, you know, adjacent to, to villages and towns. When you're talking about putting new development into existing neighbourhoods, thinking about um, those, those relationships, those connections, and how we can build those, those sustainable communities that, that last and flourish. And it's about also thinking through the development process, what we can do, what we can put back. So picking up one of the things that, that Jonathan was talking about, you know, the, the spends that we have in terms of the social economic value that we can put in through, through local spend, whether that's through materials, whether that's through new employment and training opportunities. So those things are, are broader add-ons, generally outside the planning process, but broader add-ons that the, the development brings and we need to try and target collectively to make the most of during that period of time. Um, next slide. But it's not just about a planning process. For us, things start much earlier when we're looking at sites, when we're trying to identify them, and then starting to think about how we might, uh, might master plan things before we even go out to public consultation, thinking about how we might fund it, how, how we might, might, might deliver it. Quite often we are working in partnership as, as, as on this Tangma example with, with a council, um, or it might be a housing association, and thinking about therefore the different mix of, of homes that we can bring and different types of community facilities as well. But then thinking all the way through whether design and place making the planning element, thinking about the capacity for people to engage. Um, we uh, did, uh, are in the middle of doing a, a, a large development in, in a London borough where I think there are 32 different communities, whether that's faith communities or, or social communities or ethnic communities, and engaging all those different people in that process. And sometimes people need um, the uh, to in, in, uh, build up that capacity to be able to properly engage with that process because it, it might be alien to them, it might be unfamiliar, they might not have time, they might have other responsibilities or might be other barriers stopping them. But then it also doesn't stop there. I mean, uh, leaving aside the development phase itself, where there will obviously be mud on road and there'll obviously be some issues that, that people need to deal with. It's thinking about the, the long term, whether that's the quality of the build, whether the aftercare, thinking about that longer term stewardship piece, which is as important and sometimes even more important in terms of when you're grounding a new community, making sure that the long term nature of, you know, who cuts the open, who, who cuts the grass, who maintains it, who's going to repair and, and maintain it, who's going to help build that social fabric as well. That's equally important um, to those communities and, and from our perspective to ensure that they are successful places. Um, and that leads us um, on, uh, on the next slide to um, thinking about four key principles that support that strong and resilient um, community. Um, and they are in, uh, engagement, empowerment, partnership and stewardship. And we sort of touched on these hopefully throughout all the different presentations. Um, the in, engagement um, in obviously being out there, being involved and, and we, we picked up or Martin picked up in terms of that engagement and going out and getting people involved whether in terms of different different styles, whether that's a competition or walks or things. And Andrew was talking about getting people um, in, involved through the engagement of you know, developing plans and things like that. But then the empowerment of people, giving people giving people the control to take some of those decisions to or guide the decisions in case of a the neighbor plan and, and, and the, the briefing document to, be able to guide those decisions um, to to enable the developers when they're coming on board to to understand that and take those those views on board to create that partnership because um i, I spent a long time in government before i went into the private sector and, and i i there are far too many separations and dividing walls between different parts of, of the built environment sector and, and local government. And I think one of the things we need to do far, far better is that partnership element of, of working together, because that's how we create um, uh, you know, good design and, and positive new communities. And then lastly, on that stewardship, I've talked about that long term nature of the development. Yeah, you can share my nice picture at the end. That's fine. Um, so. Uh, 
I'll wrap it up now. So we'll drop the slides down. And um, according to the time scale timetable, we have sort of five minutes or so um, to to pick up any questions or comments that, that people might have um, in our audience. If you do have any, you can either put them in the chat, you can uh, wave your virtual hand or you can turn on your screen and wave a, a real hand if you want to. Um, but uh, has anybody got anything they particularly want to to pick up on from the presentations. Okay, fine. Well, I I'm going to I'm going to pick up on on one of the things that um, I think sort of Andrew talked about and, and and Ellen talked about in terms of that that the community engagement elements and 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 thinking about the way we can engage different elements of communities and um and Andrew I'm interested. You know, you were talking, and this is going to be a different question from last time. Um, uh, interested in the way the neighbour plan came together, and for example, how you engage with um, the, the younger people within the community, or, or the older people, or the different sectors. How, how did, did you get to go about that in different ways as part of the development of, of the neighbourhood plan as you were bringing that forward? Yes, that is a different question to the past the, the first one. Um, well, we we have a, a bi a bi monthly magazine. We have uh, a lot of youth clubs and groups around the, uh, the village. And, and we've got parish council members that were going around all of these areas talking to, to people. Uh, we held lots and lots of public meetings. And one point I didn't make is each of those documents that we produced in the early years was circulated to every single house. So they were questionnaires that they returned. We got a 60% return rate on, on one of our questionnaires where we got over 600 replies. And that gave us absolutely the words and, and the thoughts and, and the aspirations uh, of the residents. And then when we brought people back to a public meeting, we showed them what they, you know, the old story, tell them what you're gonna tell them, tell them what they're gonna, and then tell them again what you've just told them. And I think that's what we did. And I, by the time we got down to that process of the neighborhood plan, I think we had, we had all the members in the community with a clear view as to what our objectives were and what their aspirations were. And all we now have to do is deliver it. Thanks, um, Andrew. And I'm going to chuck something different at Ellen this time as well. Um, what, what would, you know, thinking about building on what we've done already, uh, what, what, what might we do and how might we do things differently in terms of, you know, we've got a, or nearly got an outline planning consent on this scheme, but taking it forward to the next stage, what, what's sort of the engagement that we're thinking about doing to make sure we're in, in, including as many people as possible? I think, as uh, as mentioned with the engagement we did before, all of that took place pre-COVID and obviously with uh, new variants and everything else that's going on, I think that's going to force us to think differently when we um, take forward the next stages of engagement, um, when we get into the detailed design. So I think it's probably going to be a combination of, of in-person events where we can hold them, because I think that um, direct contact with people is still important, where you can still hold those events safely. Um, but also, um, you know, I know we've gone over projects we've been working on we've done things like um, zoom events like this where we kind of present the scheme and people are able to kind of put their hands up and ask questions and interact in that way so you're able to reach people who might not be able to take the time out to come and pop down to the, to the village center for an hour or so on, a, on an evening but might be able to dial in from home or wherever else they might be so hopefully that will help us uh, reach a much broader cross-section as well moving forward um, by combining the, the in-person and the digital Ellen, thank you. Martin, you might have missed out on your question. Diana, you've got your virtual hand up. Would you like to? Uh, yeah, excellent. You can't forget. Going over to you. Um, thank you very much. I'm just thinking. I mean, to make this sort of situation work, you need to have at least three components. You need to have a planning authority that's willing to look at it in this sort of way. You need to have a developer that is concerned and you, uh, also committed to this sort of approach. And you need to have a community that is prepared to be proactive, but also engaging positive rather than negative. Where would you say that any of those three was the critical starting point? Because we hear so many other examples, including where I come from, the Isle of Wight, where we don't have any of those and it all turns out exactly the opposite way. Diana, thank you. That's a great question. I'm actually going to chat that at Martin, thinking about um, deliverable leads and, you know, your SPD you were talking about, you know, that's that's not something a civic trust does, that's something a council does. You know, how are thinking about those relationships that, that Diana just picked up on? I, I think it's, I mean, it's, it, it's a tricky one. And I think um, 
you know, the, the particular example I gave um, is, an, is an example of a project where there isn't an obvious ready-made community to th that would perhaps, dare I say, lead a local authority to think we need to do something here because people are shouting out for change. Actually, um, there's probably dissatisfaction, but there isn't the critical mass of people to actually rise up and say, come on, let's do something. So in that situation, you know, I think it's reasonable for uh, as, lo as long as as long as you ensure that the the end what what you end up with at the end has has general support and 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 uh, people actually believe in what what the final product is. How you actually go about producing that in 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 that situation is is perhaps a bit more there's a bit more flexibility. Um, and you know, we've kept the local authority informed. Uh, we've had meetings with them periodically to say this is what we're doing. We've, we've been we've got their blessing certainly local councillors have supported what we're doing um but there is that 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 realization that, that the local authority can't can't put the resources in that it would like um and there isn't maybe the you know the critical mass of people on on the ground to to, to work on anything either so it's a, it's, a, it's an interesting situation thanks martin and I, i'm just going to put it to a, a close now diana i think you you've you've touched on exactly the types of things we were talking about that broad importance of that partnership working it needs all the different people to be willing to do it and quite often in this engagement process you go around in a slight circle and um, we haven't got time to unpack it now but you know Andrew was talking earlier um, about actually at one stage of the developments that people saying well uh, he was saying, well, actually, perhaps we should have more homes here to get more of the, the things that we want. And actually, that was a positive response to the community identifying, you know, what they wanted to deliver, what they wanted to achieve, and also what they wanted to not have in other places. They didn't want any other houses elsewhere. They wanted it all in one place that they could control and develop. But you are right that you need those different elements of a receptive and well-resourced you know, district or local planning authority council you know they need to be able to have the resources to engage as well don't they um and, and have the the vision to be able to to engage a parish council who is able to to step up and have the capacity to do that either through their paid staff that Jackie Wheeler was talking about earlier, putting a bit more on, on the precept in terms of being able to support that or within the, you know, the active volunteers, the active councillors there. But you also, you know, and I do, do appreciate from a developer's point of view, you need a, a positive and active developer who is willing to engage and willing to go on that journey. And, it, and it's it's not always one, it's not always the other that, that falls down, but you do, do often have that tension. But that is what we are trying to, both through the, you know, all these people here hopefully are trying to overcome in terms of saying, well, actually that positive relationship and the positive joint working is how you get far more out of uh, building communities and, and, uh, than, than you do uh, apart. So I'm going to draw it to a close now. Uh, just to remind you, you have uh, 15 minutes of break before plenary four, which is over in the 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 other the other system. But uh, thank you all very much, and thank you to our panel and speakers. And uh, have a good rest of conference, everybody. <laughs>